Welcome to Fantasy Football Today. DFS, my name is Sian Ajad. That is Mike McClure. Mike McClure is back with us, of course, for the game-by-game -game preview. He's never going to miss that. Uh, Mike, how you doing? How's your week going? Uh, doing well. Been a, a great week. Uh, obviously, the big night on Monday night on the showdown uh, slate. It's kind of continued. I've had a lot of success so far this week and everything I've been betting. So it's it's good. And the good news is, is I really like the Thursday game. And I think it's a really fun, interesting slate uh, for the main slate as well this week. So we're going to go over that at the end of the show. But I got to say, um, throughout this entire show, this live show that we're doing, I might be a little distracted because my big first round leader play, you know, I, I um, you, you, everybody knows, Mike, you, you do a ton for Sportsline. I do a little bit for Sportsline, which includes writing up the first round leader article every week. And I wrote up six guys. But on another show uh, for Win Daily, I, I kind of centered on one guy and it was Tom Hoagie. And he oh. he is he's got the lead right now. Of course, the whole afternoon is going. So I am sweating that bet really badly. I'm not I'm not watching it well because that would just be excruciating. But I'm gonna wait after the show. I'm probably gonna have to sweat another couple hours to see if anybody catches him or surpasses him. But for those of you that didn't know, um, you know, just um, I'll repeat it again. Mike and I do stuff for sports line that's not just NFL related. Mike does stuff for all sports, but I do stuff um, with the NFL, with props, and with uh, with golf as well. So definitely check out sports line. Check out the early edge of the Daily Show. But Mike, I, I want to get into it. But before we get into the main slate, I do want to say everybody that's watching, please hit the like button, and that's going to be really important because one thing that you have asked, you being the audience, the listeners, is for Mike to give out. His, his his favorites at each position, like his, his top three, for example. We're going to do that if we get to 100 likes today. So definitely get in there, hit the like button. I'll check in with Zach, our producer, periodically to see how close we're getting. If we don't get to 100, we're not going to do it. Um, we're trying to incentivize you all to um, hit the like button. And I know that's going to be good information coming from Mike. So obviously, we'll do our cheat sheet as well. We're going to try to touch on showdown at the very end of the show. But man, that's a lot to do. So Mike, you ready to get started? I'm ready to get started. You're right, though. It is a lot to do, but we're going to cover it all. Let's do it. That's right. And, and for the record, and I've said this before, there might be some games that we're just going to fly by. Like, we'll mention them, and we might mention a player or two. But to me, there are like four or five games. And, and we know this from the Tuesday show. Those of you that listened or watched that, we know that there are some games that are just really great games to stack. We've seen the implied totals from Tuesday. Um, we've seen sort of the, the against the spread, all of those things. Uh, are, go are going to be really important. There's some games that are just kind of kind of duds. So we'll touch on those, but we're really going to focus on these bigger games. One of them, Mike, is the Steelers at the Bills with, and I'm I'm going to double check what the total is in that game, but it's 46 and a half. So it's gone up about a half a point from 46 from Tuesday, uh, which is interesting. But this is one of those games, Mike, that I think people look at and they they do a double take because they see the 46, they see the 46 and a half, they see the Bills. That's all great but they also see a 14 point spread. And I think we've come to the place now where we're not necessarily always interested in a run back. If we, if we believe in the implied total, which the bills have the highest this week, then we can go ahead and smash that game and just hope for the best. My question for you is, is this a game you're stacking? And do you think the Steelers can fight back a bit to, to keep this within 10 to 14 points? I think they can fight back. Uh, I would say fight back may not be the right scenario. I think the scenario that they keep it within 14 is not necessarily fighting back. It's just limiting Buffalo, uh, you know, with a defense, a game that's just a lot lower scoring. Um, I'm not in the camp that believes that's going to happen in this spot. If it does, that's great. Uh, I don't think it'll impact me too much. Uh, as far as my interest in the game and stacking it, there's really only one way that I would go about this. Well, I guess two. Um, and that would be a Josh Allen stack where I would also play the defense where you're essentially onslaughting a blowout victory for Buffalo, hoping the defense creates some turnovers and some short fields in which Josh Allen totally, uh, you know, cashes in on those opportunities. Um, I think that's the only real scenario. So I could see Josh Allen on his own. I could see the Josh Allen onslaught, but the real stack here is Josh Allen and the Bills defense. Let me ask you this. On the Steelers' end, I think it's pretty clear that George Pickens is going to be reasonably popular. We saw what Pickett did with him in a very small sample size. I do need to emphasize that. But they are going to be need at some point, they're going to need to throw it downfield given the the way this game is going to shape up. Any interest in Pickens? Or in, you're looking at ownership, I think. I, I'm not right now. Is he becoming just super popular? And for the record, I think because of Pickens' value, I don't think Deontay Johnson is going to be heavily owned. I'm guessing Najee Harris is not going to be heavily owned. If you were to stack this game, any of those guys interest you? Um, 
you know, I'm not going to go for the small sample size on Pickens, not in a road environment for the rookie quarterback still. Uh, just not something I'm going to do. As far as ownership, yeah, I'm not showing him being owned at all, really. Um, certainly not double digits or anything like that. So if you like him, I would say absolutely go ahead and play him. But mostly a game that I am avoiding personally. Okay, that's good to know, because I think this will have some popularity to it, and maybe you'll end up swaying me. I think I'll get a piece of this game. I think I'll get kind of like that convenient stack with the value with George Pickens on the run back with uh, Josh Allen and, and Stephon Diggs. I, I do think, I mean, we do have to monitor Isaiah McKenzie. He's still technically in the concussion protocol, so I'm not sure about Gabriel Davis's status, but it looks like his ankle is okay. Um, I think Isaiah McKenzie, if he's out, any thoughts on Khalil Shakir? for a 3,200, just kind of throw away uh, value play. And before you answer that question, we got a comment in from Gabriel. Hit the like button for Sia, giving us the joke of the year with a Tupac song, Titles Play on Words. Thank you for the, uh, thank you for that, uh, Gabriel. And uh, yeah, that, that joke spawned from Khalil Shakir. Any thoughts on him this week? Uh, I don't think it's necessary unless we have some big injury news that really, you know, necessitates it. Um, I think it's okay though at 3,200, if you're considering a value wide receiver, it, it's really possible. The issue that I have with it is, is, is it really going to be necessary both from your standpoint and the Buffalo Bills standpoint in general? Um, so I'm not going to go there. Um, I totally understand the interest. And if you think the game gets competitive, I, I think that's fine, but I'm more on the side of willing to bet against Kenny Pickett until I've seen it. And when I say I see it, I need to see it probably three games in a row. Um, mm -hmm. I just, I, I do in this spot. So this spot being a, a pretty hostile road environment uh, against what we presume to be a pretty good football team, not the situation that I am eager to jump into. Okay, so let's go to another game that has a very, very similar total. It was 47 and a half on Tuesday, it's now down to 47. Not a big difference there. The implied total for the Buccaneers, I believe, is the second highest on the slate behind those very same Buffalo Bills that we talked about. It's the Falcons plus nine at Tampa Bay. Again, a 47 point total at this point. Um, it, actually, that total that that it, that spread has gone up to 10. So the Bucs are a, an even bigger favorite than they were on Tuesday. I mean, I think we know how this game stacks up to some degree. I mean, Atlanta's defense, they just can't stop anybody. Team, we, we covered it on Tuesday. Teams are scoring it at almost a 50% rate against the Atlanta defense. What's interesting here, Mike, is the Buccaneers haven't established much of a running game. And that coincides with, it's Thursday, but with, I believe, a healthy Godwin on Sunday, certainly a healthy Mike Evans. I, I, I don't hate just stacking Tom Brady with both of those guys. Do you hate that? Is that just too much in a game that might not have the back and forth that we're looking for? No, I don't hate it at all, uh, just because I also think the Bucks defense plays incredibly well in this game. So I think there's going to be plenty of opportunities. Um, look, it's another home game for them. They lost two in a row here. Still get to be at home, fortunately. Uh, I think they run it up. I, I think they run the score up here. I think the Bucks literally score 35 plus on their own here. Um, so Tom Brady's my top quarterback of the week by a pretty significant margin. Uh, I'll have him with Mike Evans. I'll have him stacked with Leonard Fournette, uh, who I view more as a, a tight end than a running back in this spot. I think he's going to have the ability to run the football. He's going to catch passes for sure out of the backfield. Um, so yeah, all in on the Bucks stack, definitely favorite side of the week. And given Tom Brady's price and Godwin's for that matter, and Evans isn't that prohibitive either. I'm just curious, are these guys also in your cash game builds at all? Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, I, I really like this Brady stack. I think this is one of those games where Brady just kind of shows every, like reminds everybody who he is. And it's just such a good opportunity at home coming off a, a pretty bad loss. I mean, it's vintage Tom Brady to come here and throw for four or five touchdowns. I mean, I genuinely believe that. Um, I mentioned, Mike, you might hate this because some of these lower end guys, like, I'll admit it. I mentioned them a lot. Sometimes like last year, I'd, I'd, I'd mentioned the, the, the darling $3,100 receiver just because I, I thought, well, maybe – but we got Kate Otten here at 2,500, and Cameron Brake did not practice today. He's in the concussion protocol. So the, the second man in is going to be Kate Otten at tight end for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He caught three or four passes last week, so it's not like he hasn't been involved in the passing game. He gets a full four quarters, presumably. Rookie out of Washington, drafted first pick out of the fourth round. So there's some draft capital there at that position. It, you, do you throw him in in any lineups? Do you hate it? Oh, I don't hate it at all. 
Uh, I think it's a really, really good call. I think it's an interesting spot for him. But the fact that he had four targets, uh, you know, it sounds really silly to say this, but there's a massive difference for a tight end having four versus two targets, right? You say mm-hmm. he had targets at two versus four. Four at the tight end spot, that that's pretty significant. So, yeah, at this price point, love pairing him uh, with Brady. I think the situation where I'm doing it, though, is it would likely be a Brady, Evans, Otten, and Fournette kind of lineup. It would be just a full-on onslaught where I'm likely just looking for all the offensive points. Um, yeah, I, I like it a lot. So I think people this week, before we leave this game and we bounce to the Dolphins and the Jets, uh, which has a somewhat surprising total to me of 46, you know, people in redraft leagues, they, they spent a lot of their fab, they spent a lot of their waivers on, well, I think some some people did, on like Tyler Algier. Some people just grabbed Caleb Huntley off the, off the wire after waivers cleared. Uh, none of those guys are interesting to me from a DFS standpoint. Frankly, they're not interesting to me from a redraft standpoint either, but any of those guys in play for you, uh, and for that matter, Kyle Pitts did mispractice this week, or excuse me, today. We're not 100% sure if he's going to play, but Drake London is in this game, and he's you know, a reasonable 5,900. Any of those guys I mentioned in play as a bring back? Uh, yeah. Um, let me check here where I've run everything. London will be a little bit. Um, we don't necessarily know on, on Pitts yet. If, if he plays, he's always in the player pool when you're stacking the game up, uh, especially at that price point. But it's not my first priority to have a bring back, believe it or not. It's more of a a situation kind of like the bills where I truly think this is a 35 plus point day. Um, And yes, it could be 35, 24, something like that, but it could also be 35, three here in the spot. Oh, I I completely agree. And honestly, like we keep repeating it show after show, but like you don't, that, like it's great to correlate your lineups, but do it when you're supposed to do it. You don't need to chase a correlation if, if you don't like it. So um, I totally agree with the, I mean, you know, as much as I like London, I, I just really question what Mariota is going to do against this Buccaneers defense. And I'm not interested in any of the running backs. Of course, I'm not interested in Kyle Pitts. So uh, I, I like, uh, I like that call quite a bit. You don't have to force the bring back. So let's talk about the dolphins and the jets. This is at New York. Miami is a three-point favorite at the Jets. It's a 46-point total. Speaking of 46, we got Ramel Clark in the chat, good friend of mine. He says 46. He's a big Dolphins fan. So uh, thanks for joining us, Ramel. We have some questions about showdown tonight. We're going to touch on that at the very end of the show. Don't forget to hit the like button because we're trying to get over 100 so we can give out Mike's top three at each position. Oh, and by the way, if you haven't reviewed this podcast yet, please go to Apple or Spotify or Stitcher, wherever you consume it. And please go ahead and review that. It takes like two seconds, literally. Um, I meet the Jets. You know, I don't think a lot of people are on this game, Mike. Um, However, it's it's 45 and a half now. Miami's favored by three. How are you feeling about this game from a game flow standpoint? Are there any pieces you like? This is a game I'm I'm kind of avoiding, but I got to admit, guys like Brees Hall and Tyree Kill are pretty interesting to me. Yeah, uh, so I... Short answer, I like this game. Um, it's mostly one side, but I could see throwing a bring back in there. Uh, I could tell you one of my quarterbacks is in this game, actually. Oh, wow. Well, can I? I mean, I I got a 50% chance here. Um, <laughs> is it Teddy Bridgewater? It is Teddy Bridgewater. He is uh, one of my quarterbacks here in this game. Uh, I, I like him a lot. I think he actually looked really good. Uh, against Cincinnati. He he ended up throwing the one interception there in in a really unfortunate situation. And while, yes, they knew Tua was a little banged up, he was not truly prepared for that game. Now we've got the long week here ahead of this game. Uh, Having weapons like this, Teddy's always been fine in the past, right? He's been a game manager. He's been able to come in. The only thing that's different this time around is he's got two insane weapons here with Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell. He's still a capable quarterback. Look, they're going to bail him out. He's going to have enough passing yards. It's just a matter of do they score the touchdowns on the passing? I personally think they do. It's not terribly dissimilar from Geno Smith last week that I played and, and frankly won a decent amount of money playing Geno Smith. I like this spot for Teddy Bridgewater because of the weapons. It just is a cheaper version of stacking two at a Tyreek. Uh, you can mm-hmm. do it now. I like it a lot. I'm going to do it. You don't have to jump along and do it with me, everybody out there. It is, uh, you know, it might seem a little crazy. You, Some of you probably thought Geno Smith was a little crazy last week. Uh, but this is a spot that I've isolated that I really, really like. Uh, I don't know if you're looking at ownership numbers right now, but I, um, I'm imagining, like, even if you don't want to stack it, I'm imagining a guy like Tyreek Hill 
has little to no ownership because of just the situation in this game that people might not be as in love with uh, versus four or five other games on this slate. How is his ownership looking? Yeah, I've got it around 10 to 12%. Uh, um, higher than I thought. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think that number could be as low as 7 to 8. Uh, I think it'll ultimately be 10 to 15% because I'm going to play him and tell the subscriber base on Sportsline to play him. So I think that that's – it definitely has an impact on it. Um, but it's not a situation where he's going to be 20% or anything like that. Um, so I'm guessing – I'm going to go ahead and say like 10 to 12 if you all thought that was some kind of arrogance by M squared, Mike McClure, in terms of him shifting the market. So here's here's the experiment. I want you to watch Mike on the early edge, and I want you to hear him give out a play, whether it's football or baseball or you name the sport. He does it all. And then I want you to run to your sports book and see how fast that line changes. He's not the only one that does it on sports line and on the early edge. Prop stars, there's yeah. so many guys that that literally move these markets because of you know, their subscriber base and, and the, uh, to sports line and whatnot. So uh, yeah, that, I, that's, that's very interesting because I, I honestly would have thought Tyreek would have been closer to the six to 8% uh, ownership. And uh, that might explain why he's going to be up a, a few more notches over that. Uh, anybody else in this game that that's interesting to you? I mean, I, I don't know that I want to gamble between Elijah Moore and Garrett Wilson. I assume same for you. Yeah, I'm probably not going to go there. Um, you know, I could play Brees Hall a little bit. It's sort of a bring back, even though it's not necessarily a bring back. Um, the thing that I'm curious about is what does the receiving game look like for him? So we saw, you know, obviously the quarterback change, right? So we don't mm -hmm. necessarily know what that's going to look like. I was encouraged that there were six targets last week. You only caught two of them. Uh, week before that, 11 targets. Um, week one, nine targets. Week two, one. So I, it's incredibly volatile. We actually, on Sportsline Literally Edge, we talk about running back receiving and how volatile it can be. Um, I like that I've seen 11. I like that I've seen nine. And I like that I saw six. So the fact that he was even remotely considered there, I got to include Brees Hall in my player pool. And if you wanted to just snag a piece from this game, would Raheem Mostert be in the conversation? Maybe a skinny stack or maybe just a piece. I believe he's 5K. Yeah, I think it's okay. Um, there's a couple. Yeah, it's okay. There's one other running back we'll get to that's in a similar price range that I think is in a much better spot. So we'll talk about that soon. Yeah, speaking of, I don't know if you're referring to Ramondre Stevenson, but I noticed the chat has a lot of Ramondre Stevenson questions. Uh, I'll let you know that we're going to cover two games and then we're going to go right to that uh, Lions-Patriots game, which I think is is pretty interesting. So hang tight for that. Make sure if you're new, as in joining the show in the last few minutes, make sure you hit the like button. Uh, please go ahead and review the podcast. Bears at Vikings. I mean, this isn't a sexy game. This is a game we could fly by. But then again, we have Dalvin Cook. We have Justin Jefferson against the Bears defense. Uh, Vikings are at home. Seven and a half point favorites. It's a 44 point total. One of the lower totals uh, in the on the slate, but you know, that the concentration of targets and rushing attempts to Dalvin cook and Justin Jefferson, it, it's certainly not a, a terrible play here. I, I don't know that I want to lean on Dalvin cook unless his ownership is super low, which I, I don't know that it will be uh, Justin Jefferson. I'm, yeah. I, I just don't like anything in this game. How about you? Yeah, I don't like a lot at this point. Uh, Dalvin cook, it really depends on the ownership. I'm showing about 12%. I was hoping it'd be six to seven. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm glad that it's not 20. I can say that for sure. Um, so he's still playable, but I don't think I'm going to end up getting anywhere here. Uh, Cause if I'm going to pay for Justin Jefferson, I honestly, I'd rather have Cooper cup. Uh, I'd rather go down to Mike Evans a little bit. I, I think there's a number Tyreek Hill we've already talked about. Um, I think I'm going to be off Jefferson in this spot. It's, you know, I think he's a great play in a 150 max type thing, like the Millie maker, things like that. Cause he's certainly not going to garner the ownership that, his talent deserves um because it's well within the possibilities that cousins only has two touchdowns in this game they both go to jefferson he has 130 yards like that is entirely possible here in this matchup um but i'm mostly going to be off of it because i think that it's a pretty good matchup for their defense i think it's a pretty good matchup for uh, dalvin cook um just not a situation that i can get to at these price points all right. And for those of you that are listening uh, on the podcast after the fact, uh, just know that Zach has all of these games up with the prices that we're referring to. He's clicking on some of the game logs as well. So it is really a, a somewhat enhanced experience uh, watching this on YouTube. And sometimes we get to hear Mike McClure crack his liquid death. Are you drinking a liquid death right now? 
I am not. We are out of liquid death in the what? place here today. I did not run down and get some before the show. It's been a it, Thursdays are a busy, busy day. Rightfully so. Busy means good. It means we're making some money. Uh, got a lot of opportunities to make money. Uh, but yeah, no liquid death today. Maybe next well, week. Well, Mike, please don't disappoint us next Thursday. Thank you. Unacceptable. Okay, so here, here's what is acceptable. Terrible transition. But Chargers minus two and a half at the Browns. This is a 47 and a half point total. Mike, I love this game. This is probably my favorite game of the slate in terms of stacking. Uh, and what I mean by stacking, I'm talking about stacking with a run back because I like that Patriot, the um, Buccaneers game quite a bit, but I just don't know that I'm going to be correlating that as much as I might be correlating this game. We have two teams that are allowing a ton of points. Um, I think when you look at the Browns, you're thinking, well, I'm surprised the total is that high, but the Browns are scoring a ton of points. They're, they're top 12. Both of these teams are top 12 in plays and points per game. Um, the Chargers are allowing 30 points per game. Their defense gets J.C. Jackson back, but the defense has not looked stout and they're particularly weak against the run. So I really feel like this is a Nick Chubb, maybe a Kareem Hunt game, and the Chargers can't really establish the run, and the the, the Browns' pass defense isn't very good. So I, I could really see this being a back and forth with Cleveland really doing it th- on the ground and Justin Herbert and company doing it through the air, whether that's to Mike Williams or, or Gerald Everett or Austin Eckler, like we saw last week. I just love the different permutations you can you can use with this game, the different types of game scripts. Like if it's staying close, Nick Chubb. If it's not staying close, maybe you throw in Kareem Hunt and you take out Nick Chubb. But I just think Nick Chubb is in a smash spot here, and I think the Chargers are as well. What say you? Yeah, I uh, I I'm not as high on the Chargers as that you as you are. Um, I think the pace of play can take away some of the opportunities on their side. Uh, I love Nick Chubb. He's going to be one of my favorite plays this week. Uh, Maybe not quite in cash games, definitely all over the place in tournaments. Uh, Would you be interested if I told you Nick Chubb is currently projecting for 5% or less ownership on this slate? Because that's where we're at. And I am very excited about it. Like I have been a couple times already this season. Uh, I... I love it because there are a couple of running backs at the top. I'm just going to mention them real quick so that it'll make more sense why Nick Chubb is projecting at 5%. The second highest owned, uh, the the top two most owned players on the slate after Tyler Higby, who everyone's going to play, it seems. Mm -hmm. Jeff Wilson, Leonard Fournette. Then we've got Khalil Herbert, Brees Hall, and Alvin Kamara, Ramondre Stevenson. That's going to take up the bulk of the running back ownership on DraftKings this week. Makes a lot of sense at their price points, right? You want to pay up for a running back? Nick Chubb is definitely, definitely your guy. Oh, I mean, I, I just love Nick Chubb. I mean, you've been on him this entire year. Um, I remember even in week two, you were on Nick Chubb uh, instead of Leonard Fournette, and, and the whole world was on Leonard Fournette there. So um, props to you on that one. Yeah, I'm going to be on Nick Chubb here, uh, 100%. And not, th- when I say 100%, th- not a lock button play, but I'm definitely going to be on this game. And I think Nick Chubb could really, and you're right about the pace. It, like, even though they've, They've got a lot of plays in. I, I believe their neutral pace is right about – it's actually under under average, correct, Mike? I believe so, yeah. I think it is. So with that said, I mean, the pace could slow down a little bit, but I, I like both of these teams being able to score at a very efficient rate per possession. So uh, I'm definitely on this one. Let me ask you just about a couple a couple players on the Chargers side. We got to wait for the injury status of Josh Palmer uh, and Keenan Allen. Let's assume Keenan Allen is out. And let's just assume Josh Palmer is in. Um, where are you going at the receiver position? Is it is it a Justin Herbert, Mike Williams, Austin Eckler stack? Or are you taking that discount like you did last week with Josh Palmer, who in your defense, I think got hobbled throughout that game? Yeah, no, he got hobbled throughout the game, but it wasn't a uh, it wasn't going to be a spectacular performance from him anyway. Um, I'm probably just not touching the wide receivers if that's the situation. If Palmer is in and, and Allen is out, I'm probably more likely to play Eckler. Um, and kind of the unconventional stack with Eckler and Chubb. Uh, you get the obvious benefit of Eckler, you know, being involved in the passing game that, that really helps. But I personally, again, we, we disagree on this one a little bit, but I personally am not super high on the Chargers side of it. Um, if I did it, like I said, it would be Eckler with that volume that he sees and it mm-hmm. would be Chubb on the other side. All right. Fair enough. Well, listen, we're going to go to the Lions plus three at the Patriots, 45 and a half point total. But before we do that, we're going to hear a message from our partners. 
and we are back. This is Fantasy Football Today DFS. This is our game-by-game -game preview. We do it every single Thursday at 5 o'clock. Please hit the like button if you haven't already. Zach, I kind of want to pull you on right now because I'm not looking at the likes right now. Can you can you come on and, and address where we are on the likes so that we know whether Mike's going to be giving out these top three? I'm putting, him on, I'm putting him on the spot, so I don't know if he's if he's camera ready. If you're not, we can wait. Okay, so we got a lot of no, Russ. No, oh, there he is, yeah, Zach. Okay. How we doing? How we doing on likes? Let me pull it up. I know Frank is actually on the likes right now. I'm just gonna. Oh, her. that's my bad. Yeah, let's see. I think we're nearing there. All right. Let's just see. Well, everybody, get in there. Give this a like. Let's turn Zach. Give us an update when it's at 100. Just pop on unannounced and let us know. Yeah. How about that? Sounds good to me. Let's do it. All right. Thanks, cool. Zach. Lions at the Patriots. We've got Lions plus three and a 45 and a half point total. I, I think this game is really interesting. I think there's a couple pieces that are really interesting. I'm curious, Mike, how you think this game is going to flow. Uh, we don't know if we're getting Amon Ross St. Brown back. It doesn't look like we are. He didn't practice today on Thursday. TJ Hawkinson's still very much in play, exploded last week. Um, the Lions are scoring touchdowns at, at a ridiculous rate. Uh, almost 40% of their possessions, they're actually scoring a touchdown. And that's with some injuries here and there. DeAndre Swift isn't playing in this game either. Um, on the other side of the ball, the Patriots have been very efficient running the ball. And I imagine that Ramondre Stevenson is going to take some popularity here at 5,500. I believe that's his price. And maybe, maybe a little bit of Damian Harris. I like taking maybe a skinny stack in this game. I do like Ramondre Stevenson's value. I believe he got 18 touches last week. He's probably going to get a little bit through the passing game more than Damian Harris and likely a few more rushes. That's just what I'm anticipating. How are you feeling about the players in this game? It's interesting to me. Um, I like the I like the running backs. I, I like Harris a little bit. I don't mind Stevenson. I think Stevenson's going to be more popular. It makes a lot of sense. He catches passes at a higher rate. It really comes down to what you think the game script kind of dictates here. Do you think the Lions are able to go in and score points uh, and, and kind of run it up to put the Patriots in a neutral or trailing game script? It's possible. Um it sounds absolutely insane to say this outside, but I like the under in the game. And mm -hmm. uh, out loud, I like the under in the game, though. And I've liked the over in every Lions game so far this season. There's one thing that the Lions have done. They've played at home. They've played three home games already, right? And then the fourth game, the road game that they played, was in division against Minnesota in a dome in a controlled environment. Now they are stepping out of the comforts of a dome where they, they typically have had more success. Um, I just think the Patriots are better defensively, can scheme defensively. They certainly are going to milk the clock. Um, I'm kind of off the game overall at this point, um, believe it or not, which sounds kind of crazy because we've been stacking the Lions and against the Lions for quite some time now, all season, right? Um, this is a week that I'm most likely to jump off of that train. Um, as of right now, I'm trying to rerun everything while we're uh, talking. I don't know that I have any players in this uh in my player pool so far from this game yeah that's fair enough i'll tell you i'm gonna have i'm definitely going to be playing some Ramondre stevenson i don't think i'm going back to jamal williams i, I don't want to say he got lucky he got plenty of volume but i mean you know the, the other running backs were involved in that game and it, it's certainly if he's going to be anything close to chalky again uh I'm, I'm really truly not interested there uh similar to last week even though it burned me last week but i will be on Ramondre a lot i, I do want to say the lines are allowing well over five yards per carry so far this year and i, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon they're they're bottom three in the league there so i think the game plan here and this speaks to mike's fate a little bit it's almost like when the patriots played i believe it was the bills in that wind game last year where they just ran the yeah. ball and they ran the ball and they ran i'm not saying it's going to be like that but with likely bailey zappy at the helm i think you're going to see a lot of stevenson and harris and even if the lines know what's coming I expect them to have success here and there. So I am definitely going to be playing some Stevenson, maybe a skinny stack with somebody like a TJ Hawkinson, depending on the injury situation. But other than that, I agree with you, Mike. I'm not super interested in this game. And again, I don't think Amon Ross St. Brown is, is playing in this one. Mike, a yeah. game that I don't think a lot of people are going to be on. It's going to have a relatively slow pace. It doesn't have a lot of superstar options. It's a very low total. Texans plus seven at the Jaguars, 43 and a half point total. Do we need to spend a lot of time on this? Where are you at? I mean, I, when I looked, when we did the early look, I did see Trevor Lawrence at, what what was it? Like, I think 5,600. And we're looking at it now. Um, Trevor Lawrence is exactly 5,600. A stack with maybe Chris Kirk or if Zay Jones is back. I thought maybe that's interesting if the Texas can, Texans can push back. 
I'm just not sure I, I'm interested in this one. Yeah, I, I'm pretty much off of this. Uh, you know, I should always look at someone like Brandon Cooks. I, I think he's got the ability to still have a spike game at any given point. You know, we're consistently going to see seven to 10 targets for him, uh, which is enough if, if he ends up in the end zone. Um, I just, I, I'm not going to get there this week. I, I, he's always someone I look at. It's always in consideration. Like I said, we know there's going to be that one or two games this year where he has you know, the eight catches, two touchdowns. It's possible it comes against Jacksonville. I don't think Jacksonville's as good as everyone else thinks they are. Um, mm -hmm. Having said that, though, I, I don't think this is a great spot to jam them in. Agree. Uh, I will say that a lot of the, the big ticket guys for these teams that have done well over the first four weeks, they're, they're really quite priced up. I mean, Damian Pierce is now in a range where he's really priced up. Christian Kirk is now in a range where he's really priced up. Uh, James Robinson, even at 6,300. I mean, Yep. Against Houston's defense, I get it. Like you can absolutely play James Robinson and hope he gets the the like the good touches and that it doesn't go to Etienne or or J Jamal Agnew, for example. But so I think James Robinson could be a sneaky play if there's low ownership there. But again, I, I think I'm off this one. Another game that probably isn't going to garner much ownership. I have an interesting against the spread play in this game that I think I might I might give out. I haven't really finalized it, but maybe I'll talk it through with you, Mike. We've got the Titans minus two and a half at the Commanders. Um, with a 42 and a half point total. Here's the thing. The last two weeks, I have screamed at the mountaintops, bet against Washington. They had horrible matchups against Philadelphia and against Dallas. Great pass rushers, um, a bad offensive line on, on Washington's end. Carson Wentz can't really move in the pocket. So I love those bets. I actually think the commanders are a sneaky bet here, plus two and a half at home against the Titans. I don't think the Titans can harm Washington like those previous two teams did. And I think we're catching the commanders in a really good spot, maybe not from a DFS standpoint, but everybody is down on the commanders. The Titans look like they might go ahead and win the AFC South and turn it around. I don't, I mean, go ahead and give me your take on that, but any DFS plays in this game, Derrick Henry certainly possibly in play as is Curtis Samuel, who did miss practice today, but it looks like it's just an illness, not an injury. Yeah, I'll start on that. It looks like an illness. I, I fully expect him to play. Um, don't have a ton of interest. I, I'm not going to play this game. I think this game could be very, very ugly. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think this literally could be a, one of those 17-14 games where the home team emerges victorious here. Um, mm -hmm. So I do agree with you on that standpoint. Uh, I have no interest in DFS. I, I don't think there's a single play that I could get to. I totally agree. I mean, as much as like with Jahan Dotson out, as much as we might want to celebrate the idea of Terry McLaurin soaking up some more targets downfield, I just don't think this game script is going to play to that like it might if they were playing a more high profile team where they're in a negative game script. I don't anticipate. Oh, by the way, the line, excuse me, it was plus two and a half. It's now one and a half. So um, yeah. some money going on Washington. But yeah, I, you know, even Curtis Samuel at 5,800, I might even be out on that. But I think in this game, that would probably be the only place I would go. Not interested in Robert Woods, not interested at Derrick Henry at 8,200. But this next game does have some interest to me. The, the total is a little bit higher than I thought it would, in spite of it would be, in spite of the fact that the Seahawks are in this game. So, of course, the total should be high, but it's at New Orleans. The Seahawks are plus five and a half. They're five and a half point dogs. It's a 46 point total. Um, Seattle has a great offense and a horrific defense. And the question becomes, how, how is that going to play against the New Orleans Saints? Uh, they have a pretty good rush defense. Their pass defense, uh, you know, nothing really to celebrate. On the other side of the ball, I, I think the Saints can maybe do what they want against Seattle. But then again, it's Andy Dalton at the helm. Guys like Chris Olave come to mind in this game. I'm not on Rashad Penny. Penny was in every single one of my lineups last week. I don't think he's going to be in any of them this week. I just don't think this is the right game environment. This is the right matchup for him. We don't know about Kamara's injury status. I think he's going to play, but I don't know. It doesn't look like Michael Thomas is going to play. So all systems go, it would seem, for Chris Olave, who ended up getting around 25% of the target share last week, which was a little less than what it was the, the prior two weeks. With that said, I mean, he's he is going to be the go-to guy to, for Andy Dalton. Any thoughts here? Yeah, I like the game. Uh, Olave definitely in play. Uh, look, the, the air yard is just absolutely insane uh, and seemingly sustainable, really, no matter who's there. So love Olave. Uh, hot take, not hot take, but just calling it. Uh, Tyler Lockett will score his first touchdown of the season uh, in this particular matchup. Um, 
the Seahawks are kind of what we want the Lions to be and or what the Lions have been, right? Mm -hmm. they, they do have enough offensive efficiency and enough weapons to put together drives to go score enough points, remain competitive in these non in these games against non top tier teams, which they seem to play a lot of weeks, at least early in the season here. Um, and I think defensively, they're going to surrender just enough. So I like Olave a lot. I like Tyler Lockett. That'll be kind of a cash game skinny stack. I'll have them both in there most likely uh, in those Tom Brady lineups. And then I like Alvin Kamara. If he's active and playing, uh, I mean, the price point's just unheard of, right? It's $6,600. Mm -hmm. We just talked about some of the price points on some of the other running backs. Uh, who is it? Uh, the Texans running back Pierce is Pierce, 6,200, yep. right? You get Alvin yeah. Kamara, 6,600 Pierce, 6,200. Um, it's just an obvious misprice. Uh, if he's, if you want to make the assumption that he's healthy enough to be out there and be playing, um, if he's out there and playing and Michael Thomas is not, and this is that individual matchup, uh, I think we could see a pretty nice day from Kamara. So he's going to be firmly in my player pool right now because I've made the assumption he's going to play. Um, you have to watch that news, obviously, but I like Kamara, I like Olave, and I like Tyler Lockett. Yeah, and one thing to consider, specifically with Kamara, if you're looking at the weeks where he was healthy this year, the, the receptions aren't great and the targets aren't great, but that was Jameis Winston. Andy Dalton is going to be way more prone, I think, to really focus on Kamara, dump it down to Kamara for obvious reasons. Jameis is usually looking downfield first. I don't know that that's the case for Andy Dalton on every snap. So that's another reason why Kamara might be a surprise to some people in terms of what his performance might end up being. And I think uh, Andy Dalton's going to lean on him quite a bit. Let me ask you about Tyler Lockett versus DK Metcalf. Is the main reason you like Tyler Lockett over DK because the price discrepancy is pretty massive, 6,800 versus 5,600? Yeah, mostly. Uh, I just think he's going to have a, a slightly better rapport with uh, with Gino personally, but it, you can play them both. Like I, I have no issues playing uh, Metcalf at all. Like, I and like them are, both. It's just mostly what the things that I look at. Um, and the price point, obviously. And are Geno stacks in play? I mean, I, you know, I got to be honest with you. It wasn't before I took a second look at the pricing that we we see here on uh, on YouTube. But 5,500 to a 5,600 Tyler Lockett and maybe a 5,700 Olave, it allows you to do some things that people who might roster Josh Allen or Jalen Hurts might not be able to do. Then again, the, the flip side of that, of course, is, well, you pay 500 more, you get Tom Brady. That's the, that's the only issue, right? Um, and, and that's really why I'm playing Teddy Bridgewater, who we talked about just a little bit. I'm playing Teddy Bridgewater because of the price point between him and Tom Brady. You look at the price points there, 5,400. People just saw Geno play a really good game at 5,500. They've seen Geno put together three serviceable games at that price point. Not many people are going to play Teddy Bridgewater relative to Geno after last week and then Tom Brady only being 6K. Um, yeah, it's, you're not spending up much. I think that if anything, this would be a great week to spend up if you can find someone to spend up on. Absolutely. All right, so let's move to the next game. This is the first 4 o'clock game. So just like we've had the, the previous weeks, we have one 4.05 game, and then we have two 4.25 games. I point that out because of late swap. If you're in a position to late swap, you can – Late swap before 4.05, but then you can still late swap after 4.05 to the extent you have spaces available to pivot on or off of players in this Eagles-Cardinals game or Cowboys-Rams game. Those are the two at 4.25. But the one at 4.05, I mean, let's – you know what, Zach? Let's click on the defense because I want to see the price for the San Francisco 49ers defense. 3800 Honestly, I think it should be higher. Uh, I, I don't see myself playing anything in this game other than perhaps – the 49ers defense with, let's say, Jeff Wilson, who's just getting a lot of the volume, uh, particularly in that running back room. Uh, anything you're interested in here? I, I'm very interested in the game. Uh, the 49ers defense, I suppose you could make that uh, a priority um, as long as enough value opens up there. Love Jeff Wilson once again. Um, I, I think that the volume is just going to be there in this spot, right? So... 18 carries last week uh, against the Rams in a game that, frankly, I expect a somewhat similar game script here. Um, I, look, I think this is a great spot for him. And if for some reason the game gets ultra competitive, he might have a few receptions out of the backfield as well. But at 5,500, I, I like him a lot. And I think that he'll probably 
I'm trying to think. I'll look at the ownership again. Maybe not. It's going to be fascinating to see the ownership on Wilson versus the uh, the Patriots guys because I tend Stevenson, to think the Patriots yeah. guys are going to take some of that ownership away from him. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe everybody just plays both and plays the third running back with like Fournette uh, in the flex potentially. Um, but I really like Jeff Wilson again. Yeah, 5,500, certainly reasonable. Carolina defense isn't horrible, but they're going to be put in a lot of bad positions uh, because of the San Francisco defense combined with uh, Baker Mayfield. So I don't think we need to touch on that game anymore. Let's go to the, four, the first 425 game, first of two, the Eagles minus five and a half at the Cardinals. Now, this is a game that people are going to stack for sure. It's a 49-point total. Eagles certainly have a pretty high implied total here. They're on the road. It's Kyler Murray. I haven't really been interested in Kyler Murray this entire year. I personally am, I continue to not be interested in, in him against the Eagles defense. And I worry in this game, and maybe I think you might have the opposite take here. I'm not sure. But I worry in this game that the Cardinals, and I've been saying this, by the way, for a few weeks now, are so much worse than people think that this is one of those classic Eagles games this year where they're just sitting on a lead in the second half and they just don't really need to do much in terms of pushing the ball down the field. That doesn't mean I'm not interested in stacking this game because I'm hopeful that the game script can kind of go back and forth a little bit. But this Eagles team is so much better, in my opinion, than the Cardinals. Yeah, uh, they are. So I have some concerns. We, we definitely disagree on the game uh, here in this spot. I like the Cardinals. I'm betting on the Cardinals this week. Um, it's a tough spot for the Eagles in that they haven't really played much competition so far this season, and they haven't had to travel to do so. Uh, they played one true road game in Detroit to open the season where they allowed 35 points to the Detroit Lions, one by three. Um, other game, they beat a Minnesota team that we're not sure how good they are. They beat the Commanders in what is basically a short bus ride uh, to play that game. Um, they covered at home against Jacksonville. I'm not impressed with Jacksonville. I've been on the camp that doesn't think Jacksonville's, you know, close to a playoff team. None of that. Right. Agreed. Now they have to travel cross country, switch time zones here, play on the road. Now, now they have a look ahead spot to next week, which can really decide the division at home in prime time against Dallas. Um, you know, I'm not saying they're going to lose a football game. I think they ultimately win. I think Kyler hits them with the backdoor cover, which is why I like Kyler in DFS quite a bit. Um, he, he's someone I'm going to be playing in tournaments for sure. Uh, you look at the game log, right. From Kyler here, and it's not that bad. 16 against the Rams, pretty horrible game for him because they didn't score a touchdown there for him. That's it. Right. Mm -hmm. Every other game we're talking low to mid twenties, hasn't had a great game. Hasn't done anything with his legs yet. My theory on this too, is playing an opposing quarterback who uses his legs more will open Kyler up to potentially running more on his own as well uh, in this higher profile quarterback matchup. So I like Kyler Murray. I, I'm playing him in tournaments. Again, I think they ultimately cover the spread. I think there's also the chance that, which would be great for DFS. Like if you're playing Kyler Murray, you want this team to be down by two touchdowns. Like that, it sounds weird to say that, but that is absolutely what you want. You mm -hmm. want softer coverage. You want prevent defense. You want him to be able to run, scramble, extend drives because I envision the scenario here where even if they ultimately lose by 10 to 12 points, Kyler Murray scores 30 plus fantasy points in this game. So who are you, who are you, are you pairing him with Marquise Brown and how are you stacking this game then? Yeah. So I like Marquise Brown a lot. Uh, the thing that we have to talk about with Marquise Brown, and it's kind of been out of necessity, the targets, uh, you know, you got to look at the targets because of the attempts, the, the passing attempts from Kyler have been absolutely insane in some of these mm -hmm. games because of the game script that they consistently find themselves in. And that game script is probably the most likely thing to see here, but we're looking at 11 targets, 17 targets, 11 targets here. Uh, I, I love that in this particular spot because I think that we're going to see something like that again. I also like Ertz uh, a little bit in this game. So that's kind of where I'm at on it, but I also could just play Kyler on his own. Um, this is one of those scenarios, which again, it sounds crazy, but you have to keep it in mind. If you're a showdown slate player, you do this all the time. It's entirely possible that the Eagles win this game. The Eagles wide receivers have better games and Kyler Murray through a rushing touchdown slightly outscores Jalen Hurts and becomes a better play than Jalen Hurts without stacking anyone because Jalen Hurts had a big game but didn't get the rushing touchdowns. Because the price point is different, you get way different with your build. You get different on the price point. It's, what, $700 cheaper? Um, this profiles to me as a game that you could potentially do something like that. 
So I think what I'm going to do with this game, because I do plan on playing it, but I think I'm going to play it on the other side. I'm actually going to end up fading Kyler Murray. Uh, although, I'm listen, like you certainly could be right on how, how that's going to go for Kyler Murray. I, if it's going to be competitive, like you say, I think I want to be on the Jalen Hurts side for him to actually be playing for four quarters, for him to be uh, yeah, locking I'll in play. on A.J. Brown for four quarters. And, and so yeah. I have a question for you. Is A.J. Brown the run back? Or are you going with maybe more value? But for me, I think, uh, first of all, I want to monitor whether Devontae Smith's you know, injury is OK, which I think it will be. But Jalen to A.J. Brown with maybe a Marquise Brown or maybe a Ertz, if, if you can't afford Brown, run back. Or Jalen to Devontae Smith, I, I think those are very much in play. I'm not going to be leaning on Miles Sanders. I'm not chasing the points from last week. Uh, I, I really like that stack. Hurts with one of his top two receivers, likely A.J. Brown, and a Marquise or Zach Ertz at 4,800 run back. What say you on that? And and if you're bringing it back from a Kyler Marquise or Kyler Marquise Ertz stack, who is the bring back for you? Yeah, I mean, A.J. Brown's definitely the top uh, option in this one for me. Uh, I won't be playing Devontae no matter what here personally. Um, I, I get it. I get the interest in him, but it's A.J. Brown for me and then uh, a little Goddard. Uh, I think would be interesting here. There's a scenario where I end up playing Goddard and Ertz together in the same lineup uh, as part of a game stack here. Um, just because I, I do think that in most game scripts, I'm pretty confident that Ertz and Marquise Brown are going to be peppered with targets no matter what. Yeah, I, I can absolutely see that. And frankly, if this game really goes off, I think both of those guys are in play in a stack with it. Well, you know, right. Jalen Hurts with a receiver stack and, and both of those guys coming back. So absolutely. I, by the way, I'm just watching. So if we get to 100 likes and I, I finally know what the, I know what the likes are now, if we get to 100 likes, we get Mike's top three at each position. We're at 98 and we have 190 watching uh, us live. So, A, thanks for watching. B, if you can, like at least 100 of you haven't hit the like button. So everybody at the same time, just pull the chat down if you can. Super easy. Hit the like button. And I bet you we get to 100 in like 10 seconds. But there we go. We're at 100. So we have one more game to cover, and then we'll cover your top three, and then we'll just quickly get into our cheat sheet, maybe touch on showdown. We do have a little bit of time because we've flown through some of these games. Um, anything more on this uh, on this Philly-Arizona game, though, Mike? Uh, no, just other than I, I really love it. Um, and, and I'm just because I love Kyler does not mean I won't play Jalen Hurts. I, I, mm -hmm. I'm going to have a lineup of both for sure. Absolutely. All right. Let's go to a much lower total, a much less exciting game. So maybe we'll run through this pretty quick, but it's the Dallas Cowboys at the Los Angeles Rams. I happily faded the Rams last week and uh, that worked out for me. We have a five and a half point favorite. The Rams are favored by five and a half. I think that's interesting. It's a pretty high number, but they're at home. This is potentially a get right spot. Cooper Rush is going to be the quarterback for Dallas. It's only a 43 point total. You know, I, I'm certainly not interested in Zeke or Pollard. I think CeeDee Lamb, of course, is interesting. I don't think I want to lean on Michael Gallup at 5K, especially with Noah Brown carving out such a big role. Dalton Schultz at 3,400 is interesting, but I'm not sure he's getting the targets that he would be getting if Dak Prescott was the quarterback. I, I, honestly, we don't have much of a sample size because he just came back from injury. The, the Stafford side of it, the Rams side of it, I mean, I guess you could play Cooper Cup at 9,600. I'm not super excited about it. I'm not on any players in this game except maybe, of course, Tyler Higby. We talked about this on the Monday night early Ed show, Mike, where the reason Higby is getting all these short area targets, and frankly, the reason all these guys are getting these short area targets is because there's no field stretcher on the Rams. There's no Odell Beckham. There's no Van Jefferson right now. And if you don't have a field stretcher, then everything is going to be kind of condensed. So, And you also have a pretty bad offensive line right now. So Stafford is going to have to get the ball out really quick, especially against this Dallas front four. And I think I absolutely think Higby and Cooper Cup are very much in play. The question becomes, what are the red zone targets looking like in terms of opportunity? Cup, of course, is going to get his. Uh, Higby likely gets his as well. Are you playing either of those two? Or are you off this game? Uh, I'll have Higby in the player pool, uh, just out of necessity. I think that the while they are five and a half point favorites, I definitely think this could be a game where they struggle. And when I say struggle, like just have a competitive battle on their hands. Uh, Cooper Cup, he, look, he's playable in every single matchup, no matter what. He's proven that many times throughout his career, that any matchup is fine for Cooper Cup. He's going to have double digit targets, potentially 10 receptions again. Never going to say you can't play him. Uh, I like Higby. The issue with Higby right now is he's projecting to be the highest owned slate or player on the slate. Um, maybe deserves it. He just had 14 targets, caught 10 of them. Uh, he's had three straight games of 60 plus yards with four plus catches. That's pretty good still at 4,300, especially 
considering that he hasn't found the end zone there. If he finds the end zone, he's absolutely crushing uh, the, the value here on this. So my problem with Tyler Higby is simply the ownership. I like him. He's going to be in one of my lineups, probably not all of them, but one of them. Um, you made a call out earlier on Kate Otten as a pivot. I absolutely love that, especially because I'm playing Tom Brady. Um, the other one that I like, though, is I like Zach Ertz and I like Dallas Goddard. I, I think that game's very, very sneaky. I think that it's either going to be a, a – I think it's going to be a shootout, right? I'm just – come out and said that basically. I think it's going to be a shootout. I think they're excellent pivots away from Tyler Higby, knowing how popular he's going to be. So in this game – not touch anything on the Dallas side. You mentioned CeeDee Lamb is interesting. It's interesting that he missed practice uh, today mm. as well. So something to keep an eye on there, but I'm not intending on playing anybody on the Dallas side. I do want to mention another tight end that I want to throw into the mix here uh, that we didn't mention when we covered that Cleveland Chargers game. I do think Njoku's upside is is pretty tremendous game to game. So just somebody to throw out at 3,800 in tournaments, he's probably not going to get much ownership. So somebody to consider uh, with a, a pretty high ceiling, in my opinion, especially with a 47 and a half point total and a 22 and a half implied total on the Cleveland side. All right, that that closes out the slate. Now we just need to get into our cheat sheet and maybe a couple showdown plays from you, Mike. But let's first get into, if you have it in front of you, maybe your top three at each of the QB, running back, wide receiver, and tight end position. And by the way, real quick, that Higby call, for those of you that are kind of new, I mean, I, I think you can read between the lines. I think what Mike is really saying is Higby's great for cash. He's great for your cash lineups. But maybe in tournaments you want to do something else. Mike, is that a fair statement? Yeah, definitely, definitely a fair statement. So again, and that's kind of for some of the new listeners, like if we're talking about a popular guy that, that we think is going to do well, that is the perfect guy for perhaps your cash games or one of, one of the guys for your cash games as opposed to a tournament play. So Mike, where should we start with this top three? All right. Well, we're going to start the quarterback position. If you've listened thus far, you can probably guess at least two of the three. Uh, number one, Tom Brady. Number two, Teddy Bridgewater. Number three, Kyler Murray. And I know we disagree on that one. I don't, I, I like Kyler. I think he's getting there. I'm going to plant that flag this week. If I'm wrong, I am absolutely wrong about it. And that is fine. Uh, but I like Kyler in this particular matchup. Uh, I think it's a great spot for him. Uh, mostly because no one else is going to really play him in, yeah. in this spot. So, and, and they're not going to have a ton of lineups that spend at quarterback this week. Um, so I think this is the perfect time to make that pivot and go there. And uh, for, far, for, for the record, your, your top three, th these are tournament top threes, right? Uh, well, I mean, I, I'm probably, I might or be just playing, in general. I'm playing, either, yeah, in general. Um, okay, gotcha. I keep a very narrow player pool. So yeah. in, in cash games, if I play two cash game lineups, one will be Brady, one will be Teddy Bridgewater. Uh, as crazy as it sounds, uh, I'm going down that route uh, this week. I love it. All right, running back. So running back, keeping it somewhat simple here, it's going to be Leonard Fournette is the top running back for me. Uh, it's mostly a usage and price point thing. Yes, I expect him to run the ball a little bit more than three attempts, but I also expect a heavy load in the passing game. Uh, so I love Leonard Fournette. Number two, Nick Chubb, more of a tournament play, but I absolutely love Nick Chubb in this matchup. The Chargers, not great against the run. Nick Chubb is a volume machine. Uh, while he's had, you know, decent, outputs here he, he definitely can repeat that 30 point game that he had against the jets uh, i think that is likely in this spot so i love nick chubb and then my third running back jeff wilson going to be popular i don't really care i like jeff wilson against carolina i uh, just think out of necessity he's going to have the volume the game script should be more than ideal for him and the price point at 5500 is one that i absolutely love and real quick before we get to wide receivers um if you're not convinced about what we've said about Nick Chubb. Well, let me just throw this stat out you at you because I don't think I mentioned it. They're allowing that defense, that Chargers defense is allowing the most yards per carry in the league thus far through four weeks. So Nick Chubb um, should have a day. All right, let's get to wide receivers. All right, wide receivers here. This one, it's kind of middling. It's going to be the guys that I'm going to have the most exposure to. Number one, Tyreek Hill. Uh, I like his spend up a lot this week. Again, got the questionable tag. Assuming that he's going to be fine and play, uh, he, he typically does when he's in this spot. Uh, I think Teddy Bridgewater is more than capable. And mm -hmm. look, the Jets were one of the teams he potentially was going to go play for uh, in this offseason and ultimately decided that he liked living in South Florida and not paying income tax in the state. And he's been very clear about that. So He's going to have some fun with New York. He's just one of the best players in the NFL. We're going to see double-digit targets here. Just play him. 
Uh, Tyler Lockett, Chris Olave, number two and three. Love that game environment. Again, I think that the Seahawks are closer to the Lions than we think in terms of being efficient enough offensively, terrible defensively. They're going to find themselves in relatively competitive games. Uh, and these two guys are simply too cheap. Um, you know, Lockett, he's not like a $7,500 player, but he's probably 63, 6,400. Chris Olave, we are still a little unsure here. Uh, I think there's this scenario where he ends up being a $7,000 receiver very, very quickly. Uh, if some of these air yards start to materialize even more for him. Uh, so those are the three receivers that I like real quick on, cause you mentioned Lockett and we've talked about that game quite a bit. Gino's first in completion rate this year so this is not smoke and mirrors i mean they're like they're like clearly designing oh, yeah. some the designing plays for him to, to you know have some of those short area targets to dk and and even lock it but the the concentration of targets is those two guys for the most part and he's completing the ball to those guys and you have a 46 point total super sneaky play on on uh some of the seattle side in that game all right what are we at next tight end Tight end. Uh, I'm going to give you the sh standard chalk one. It's Tyler Higby. He is still the top play uh, in this spot for me. So I, I like Higby. Everyone's going to play him. I think he's still fine in cash games. Where it gets more interesting, number two, I'm going to go with Cade Otten, someone you called out earlier. Uh, you know, this is assuming Cameron Brait doesn't play. He's in the concussion protocol, did not practice. Not sure this is a spot they rush him back in. So I do like Otten. He was involved. Uh, understand with this one at 2,500. There is a very strong probability that he does not catch a pass in this game still. Uh, I say very strong. There is a significant probability that, of that. Uh, that's a risk that I'm okay with. I'm only really playing him with Tom Brady stacks personally, um, but I, I do like him. And then finally, it's Zach Ertz because I, I'm playing Kyler Murray. I think that Ertz is playable without Kyler Murray. Uh, I expect a scenario against his former team, which he is very emotional about and has been already uh, in, in the past here. So, I like this spot for him in general. I think he's going to be peppered with targets either way, no matter how the game script shakes out. Um, but I think he ultimately finds the end zone in this game and kind of repeats that 16-point performance we saw against Carolina. All right. I love it. Uh, good job, everybody, getting to over 100 likes. Uh, maybe we'll yes. push it higher next time and make you guys really sweat it out. Maybe to 150. Maybe, no, we won't. We'll do 100 next week. Um, but everybody, thanks in the audience for hitting that like button. Appreciate it. Let's get real quick to the cheat sheet. we got a couple more minutes. Um, I'll could just go ahead and start. Uh, I'm going to have George Pickens at 4,300. I think he'll get just enough work, and he just certainly has the upside to, to make something happen here at, at 4,300 in a game where there's going to be quite the negative game script on Pittsburgh's side. My chalk play is going to be Mike Evans. Um, I think both Mike Evans and Godwin will be relatively chalky. Admittedly, I'm not looking at the ownership percentages right now. Um, my contrarian play, based on the numbers that we already talked about today with respect to Nick Chubb, um, it's probably his. Yeah, it's probably Mike's contrarian play too. I stole that from him, but I'm keeping it. We had the same play last week too for one of our plays and that's okay. Uh, we faded Christian McCaffrey. He ended up actually getting there, I think, uh, at the end of that game. But contrarian's Nick Chubb at 8,000. Uh, my fate is going to be Kyler Murray. So me and Mike are, are going to be going at it here uh, for sure. We'll see what happens. Uh, you know, maybe that's not the guy to fade because he's not really going to be that popular anyway. So I don't know. Maybe I'll adjust that one. And my stack is Brady to Evans. I think you could interchange that Brady to Godwin. Either way, um, I I'm just worried about Godwin's health. I'm not 100% sure uh, he's going to be healthy throughout the entire game. So I'd prefer to go Brady to Evans. You're getting such a discount on Tom Brady with that $6,000 price tag. So I don't mind paying the 6900 for Evans. Uh, quite the value there. And I plan on stacking that with Godwin or with Kate Otten, depending on how this week flushes out. Mike, where are we at with your top stack? Top stack? Uh, look, I was going to give you a Kyler Murray or the Tom Brady. I'm not going to give you the Tom Brady. Um, hopefully you guys are once watching the show listening. You've heard all the analysis and not just reading the cheat sheet. Tom Brady is my top stack. I'm not going to give you that because it's really straightforward in my opinion this week. And mm -hmm. you've heard me talk about that a lot. Uh, we're going to be bold with it. It's Teddy Bridgewater to Tyree Kill. Uh, I'm determined to play Teddy Bridgewater in this game. I think he has two touchdowns, which is ultimately at least two touchdowns, which is enough uh, when paired with Tyreek. So that's going to be my stack. Uh, my value play, I'm hoping this fits right in with the value uh, threshold. It's $4,800 tight end. It's Zach Ertz. I like Zach Ertz. I'm going to call anything under 5K value. Um, I, I like him in this spot. I, I think that the reason why I'm okay calling it a value play here. You can call it contrarian if you want, but we know where the ownership's going this week, and it's Tyler Higby. Uh, I think this is an excellent, excellent pivot away. Uh, so that's where I'm going with that. My chalk play, 
we've been back and forth on this guy a lot this year. At least I have. It's Leonard Fournette. I've told you I'm not playing him many times. I've told you now I'm playing him. This is a great spot for Leonard Fournette. $6,900, I think, is an obvious misprice. Should be $7,500 in this matchup. Uh, the contrarian play, like you mentioned, Sia, right there on the same page. It's Nick Chubb. Uh, it, it's offensive that he's projecting less than 5% ownership in this particular matchup. And my fade, uh, Khalil Herbert. Uh, I think mm. he's still going to garner just enough ownership. The team is not good enough. Uh, I think this is a great spot for the Vikings defense overall. So I'm going to sit this one out on Khalil Herbert. Uh, whether it's bold or not, it's $7,100. It makes a ton of sense to not go pay that kind of price point for it. However, he has been pretty efficient when he's been in there. Uh, and he's still projecting for double digit ownership. So that's a situation I'm going to get away from. All right, Mike, thank you. That is the main slate discussion. It's the cheat sheet. It's Mike's top three. Just one quick thing before we go, Mike, let's just talk about tonight's game. People are watching. They probably reserved some showdown lineups. Um, by the way, there's so many different types of price ranges. If you just want to have fun, you can do a showdown lineup for a buck, for 25 cents, whatever it is. You want a three bucks, five bucks, 10 bucks, 15. You can do a 20 max. If you don't want to just do one, um, a $3 20 max, there's there's a lot of different options. Uh, with that said, I only say that because some people it's showdown. You don't necessarily want to play just one lineup. Mike, I know you max these things out, but I just want you, I want you to tell us how you think this game is going to go and maybe a couple captains that you like and maybe some flex plays that you like as well. Yep. And I, I will, uh, use, I don't max these out anymore at all. I actually only play five lineups. Sometimes I played 10 last week or on Monday when I, uh, when I won that one. Uh, so I'm playing less than 20 always. I haven't played more than 20 all season. Uh, I've been changing the process a little bit on these, um, and having a, a lot of success doing it. I found that quickly when I'm playing 150 versus 20, that I actually ended up, uh, losing, not losing more, but cutting into my profit when it's typically the lineups that were having success were typically happening in the first 20 that I built. Um, and entering some of those while it does eliminate some of my top upside. Um, ultimately I thought that it was cutting into some of my profitability. So I'm down to playing 20 or less on these now. Um, but as far as tonight, how it goes, I think the game's going to be higher scoring than people think. Um, I think for a couple reasons. I think Denver has had a ton of bad luck in terms of touchdown variance and scoring in the red zone. They've moved the ball relatively well. I think they're on their home field in this kind of spot on a short week for the other team. That's where I would expect it to materialize into touchdowns a little bit more. On the Indianapolis side, they're not going to have Jonathan Taylor. They should be throwing the football more. That keeps the clock stopped, but it also provides more variance for bigger plays. Both of those things lead to scoring. What also happens when you're throwing the ball more? There's potentially more opportunity for penalties. On a running play, you have an opportunity for a holding, and that's mostly it, an offsides penalty. On a passing play, you have an opportunity for offensive holding. You have defensive holding. You have defensive pass interference. All of these things lead to higher scoring games. So long story short, I am on the over more than the under in this game. As far as my captain exposure, Russell Wilson at the top makes a lot of sense. I have 30% of him. Uh, Cortland Sutton, Melvin Gordon, Jerry Judy makes a lot of sense. Denver guys at the top, a uh, little bit of Philip Lindsay, a little bit of Naeem Hines. Uh, I'm mostly off of Michael Pittman. I think that he is someone who should only be played in the captain spot. I would not play Michael Pittman and flex tonight very often. And the reason for that is the price point and the matchup for him to have the amount, the game, like if he doesn't have the game that's required for him to be the captain, the probability of him having the middling game and still being in the optimal lineup is relatively low with guys like Judy and Sutton out there as well. Uh, so that's kind of my stance on that. And then overall exposure where it gets super interesting. Uh, Philip Lindsay is my second highest owned player at 65%. I expect him to come in and still have the majority of the workload despite coming off practice squad. I expect him to handle most of the rushing work in the game. Uh, I like Naeem Hines. I'm more likely to, he's about the fifth or sixth highest owned player. Uh, and then my other little flag plant will be Mo Ali Cox. Uh, led the team uh, with six targets in the last game. Uh, knowing that Pittman is going to deal with Pat Sertan in this game, I and no, there's no Jonathan Taylor to kind of open things up a little more. I expect a lot of work from Mo Ali Cox. So I'm playing a ton of him tonight. Wow, that was uh, an education. I think Showdown is is such a different ball game. And for Mike to, if if you guys are listening to this now and you you kind of didn't follow some of that stuff on the front end, 
um, go back and listen to it because I, like showdown is is different. Like, yeah, you, you need to think about game script and, and all of that. Everybody kind of knows that part. How do you think the game's going to go? But in terms of why or why not to play Michael Pittman in the captain spot versus the flex spot, those are sort of the nuanced things that maybe a lot of people just don't really pay much attention to. They're just, they just want to jam in who they want to jam into their lineup and they, they go a- along their way. So Mike, thank you for that. Uh, any comments before we get out of here leading into this week five slate? Yeah, uh, I, I don't typically handle any season-long stuff because I admittedly don't play any season-long fantasy football. But I'm seeing questions about Russell Wilson over Trevor Lawrence, Russell Wilson over golf, things like that. My answer to that would be Russell Wilson over most of those people this week. I like what I've seen out of Russell Wilson a little bit here. Uh, the last two games, he had six and four rushing attempts, which is you know 20 to 30 yards he got in the end zone last time. When he's starting to do that again, it tells me he's a little more comfortable. He's wanting to extend drives. Uh, again, we've had terrible touchdown variants on that offense. So I, I like Russell Wilson here. I think he puts up 27 to 30 fantasy points in this game again. Mike, final question before we definitely adjourn here. Somebody asked about the Dallas defense and whether they would be chalky at 2,700. Are there any, A, do you think they're going to be chalky, but B, are there any other defenses maybe in that 3,100 and below range that that you are, are in play for you? Uh, let me check. It'll take me about 10 seconds to sort and filter. Um, I would say no, they won't be. Actually, yes, they will be very, very popular. They are the highest owned defense, uh, about 20%. Um, other defenses that are comparable in price that I could see playing, uh, the commanders stand out as the best play, uh, in that spot against Tennessee, the commanders stand out as the best. Um, after that, it's probably the Patriots, believe it or not. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I like all of those. All right. Well, listen, this is our Thursday game by game preview. We, We did showdown. We did our top three. We did pretty much everything. That's our show. Thanks for coming. Next Thursday, it's me and Mike again. It's the Game by Game preview on Tuesday. We're going to do the solo pod again. It's going to be me going through last week's lineups, Mike's and myself. And then, of course, we're going to do the early look, which it, which gets pretty in-depth. We'll probably pull maybe Zach and Frank on the show a little bit too, have some fun. But that early look is really important in my opinion. So definitely join us on Tuesday. That's going to be at 5.30. This Game by Game preview, it's always going to be Thursday at 5 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Everybody, thanks for watching. Everybody, thanks for listening. Everybody, thanks for hitting the like button. One more thing to do, go hit the Apple or Spotify, wherever you watch this, and review this podcast. It takes two seconds. Hit five stars. Maybe make a comment if you want to. Very helpful. This is Fantasy Football Today DFS. That's Mike. My name is Sia. We are out of here.